everyone. Just giving you a, a minute to log on here. Well, now that I, I see uh, many of you joining here, let me get started. Uh, first, I'll just start by introducing myself. I'm Joan Romano Shiflett. I earned my PhD in 20th century American poetry from the Catholic University of America. And I uh, can't believe this, time flies, but I'm beginning my eighth year at the United States Naval Academy, uh, teaching and serving as the Writing Center Director. So I want to start today with an enormous thank you to LSU Press for inviting me to participate in their remote author series. Um, I often joke that sending my book proposal to LSU Press was like applying to Harvard. They have always been my number one choice. Uh, so when they actually picked up the book, it was thrilling for me. I've always held them in the highest esteem, and I have to say going through the publication process with them, I hold them even in higher esteem now. Uh, they've been fantastic from start to finish. So thank you to LSU Press, and a special thank you to the wonderful L.B. Kovac, who organized and coordinated uh, today's event. And thanks to all of you tuning in. Um, I see some wonderful names here. This is a great way to connect in these bizarre times. So. Great to, great to see your names here. All right, so let's, let's get started. Uh, I, today I am talking about my book, uh, my project Warren, Jarrell, and Lowell, Collaboration in the Reshaping of American Poetry, which was just published by LSU Press uh, in June. And just a little outline for today. Uh, first, I wanna take a couple of minutes to give you a sense of the whole book, the larger project. Then I will read for approximately 16 minutes, maybe 16 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, many literary panels tell me that's about the sweet spot, so hopefully I can keep your attention for that long. Um, and then I'll, I'll take some questions at the end, and I'm already seeing uh, some, of your, some of your comments here. So again, thanks for being here, guys. All right, so to start, um, the story of my book, honestly, I see it as a love story of me, um, the biggest word nerd, and I, I say that with pride, uh, just falling in love with the poetry of these brilliant poets. I still remember being, uh, being a freshman at Loyola and reading Robert Lowell's The Quaker Graveyard in Nantucket for the first time and just thinking, how does he fit all of these layers of meaning and sound and music into these lines? Um, Lowell just just blew me away. And then fast forward, you know, a few years down the road, I'm in graduate school and under the in instruction of the amazing, wonderful, phenomenal Professor Ernest Suarez. And um, Ernie introduced me to Robert Penn Warren. And I remember having that same feeling that I did when I first read Lowell. And again, the layers of meaning, the history, the philosophy, um, they were just loaded lines and gorgeous lines and powerful lines. Um, so, of course, uh, you know, Robert Lowell and, and Robert Penn Warren, originally what I had learned and what I was learning at the time, I wouldn't have thought to connect the two. Uh, we've got Lowell, this, you know, rich, aristocratic Bostonian. He's the father of the confessional poet, poetry movement. Uh, and then we have Robert Penn Warren, the quintessential Southern poet associated with the Southern agrarians. So I did not think to connect them. And in terms of Randall Jarrell, I was familiar with his literary criticism because he's a brilliant literary critic, um, but I had no idea he was such a fine poet. Um, did a little digging. Turns out that Robert Penn Warren actually taught Jarrell at Vanderbilt University and uh, Lowell at LSU in the 1930s. And in that very same decade, Jarrell and Lowell actually became really good friends. They were roommates at Kenyon College. Um, and so this little trio became very close and, and kept in touch really for the rest of their lives. And furthermore, they all studied uh, and really had their foundation under two very important figures in American poetry. And that's uh, John Crow Ransom and Alan Tate. 
So let me read uh, a little bit. Oh, and thank you for uh, for posting the Quaker graveyard in Nantucket. You can feel free to feel free to look at that. Let me just read a little bit um, to to talk about the larger scope of this too. So despite the fact that these three artists enjoyed and benefited professionally from lifelong, well-documented relationships with one another, previous histories have discouraged scholars from investigating the significance of these connections. The traditional understanding of American poetry at mid-20th century holds that after the dominance of high modernism and the new critical mode for 30 years, younger poets look to figures such as William Carlos Williams and Charles Olson in order to break free from their predecessors to create what is now defined as postmodern poetry. In addition to this breakthrough narrative, mid-century poets commonly are grouped in relation to the five major schools of contemporary verse, Black Mountain, New York School, Beat, Confessional, and Deep Image. As with most established patterns in literary history, there is utility in categorizing broad literary movements, but it, also, it is also reductive in nature. So yeah, this this nice uh, tidy tidy idea of uh, a break free from their predecessors and then all filed into these five schools. Um, of course, there's truth to this, but leaves plenty of room for nuance, which is where I dwell in my work. Um, and the, the way, I guess the structure of the book, I focus on literary history and aesthetics, and I developed uh, a streamlined narrative that includes close readings of primary texts within a variety of social, literary, and historical contexts. Uh, of course, I tried to make it fun. There's some very colorful anecdotes for all three of these poets. Um, and if I were to distill it, I'm, I'm putting this in there for any of my, my former students. Yes, you can even have a thesis statement in one sentence uh, for a book length work. So to distill it, this is kind of the main crux of, of the argument. The relationships with one another served as a catalyst for a simultaneous shift in which they transcend formalism and high modernism with a new poetic mode that, while partly reflective of these traditions, draws on innovative stylistic choices to engage in an authentic exploration of selfhood within the context of the postmodern world. So finding new ways to express themselves and being on that artistic journey together. Um, the Now, in terms of this book, I am focusing on these three poets, but it's more like a case study, and there are much larger implications. So just to raise some of those larger questions before I dive into, you know, smaller looking at, at the case study, I'll read a little bit more. The connections among Warren, Jarrell, and Lowell serve as just one example of significant literary relationships that have hitherto been ignored. The question is, how many more of these significant connections are currently being neglected due to the inadequate labels that classify American poets? What do these omissions say about the way literary history has been written? This book aims to more fully grasp the complexities and origins of contemporary poetry and forge a better understanding of American verse traditions. All right, so that's the big picture. And now I'm going to give you a little taste from chapter three. Um, chapter three is called Robert Frost, a unifying figure to guide change. Um, and just to provide a little bit of context. So as I've said, part of this common breakthrough narrative is this assertion that writers started changing their poetry in the 1950s and after. But by 1940, so 10 years prior, Randall Jarrell was already announcing the death of modernism. Um, this is an argument he elaborated on in a 1942 essay entitled The End of the Line. And not surprisingly, he was talking regularly with Warren and Lowell about what came next in the world of poetry. So I discovered that uh, part of what came next um, and, and where they got their answers for that question was looking to the poet Robert Frost for direction. So I'm going to read a little bit of chapter three and I picked this section because it'll give you a sense of how I'm weaving together um, history, close readings of poems, bits of letters, some archival material, uh, and kind of streamlining that into a narrative. All right, so here we go. 
Admittedly, the nature of this study necessitates a somewhat disproportionate emphasis on the relationships among Warren, Jarrell, and Lowell, but there are obviously additional elements that prompted these authors toward a poetic shift at mid-century. Looking past personal factors, including divorces and remarriages, physical and mental health issues, world travel, deaths of parents and fatherhood that had an impact on their work, there are several literary influences worth noting. In the studies of Jarrell and Lowell in particular, the role of William Carlos Williams is often highlighted because of his literary influence on and friendships with both poets. Um, and so then I go on and talk about, sure, William Carlos Williams, um, many critics make a big deal of Williams, and yes, Williams had an impact on Lowell, um, but mostly that was actually way earlier when he was younger. Warren, you actually see it surface kind of later on um, in his longer poem, Chief Joseph of, N of the Nez Perce. And Jarrell, you see it, but certainly not as much as Robert Frost. So diving back into that, ultimately, while Williams may have influenced Jarrell, Lowell, and Warren in highly individualized ways throughout their careers, there's another more significant figure who plays a direct role in these poets' similar, simultaneous mid-century shifts and that's Robert Frost. Leading up to Frost's simultaneous resurgence in their work in 1947, the three poets spent a considerable amount of time together. Early 1947 brought Warren, Jarrell, and Lowell together at a writer's forum at the Women's College in Greensboro, North Carolina. Warren was invited to give a lecture at the forum for which he explained, quote, one compensation would be seeing friends, and this included Jarrell and Lowell. Lowell reported to Buckman, that was uh, one of his mistresses, on the event, quote, there's lots that will make good talk that would take forever to write. Red, that's Warren, was wonderful, and I impressed everyone that I shouldn't have. Along with the formal lectures and forum events, the poets would have followed the social model they learned in their college years. Poetry, alcohol, and more poetry. Um, Jarrell didn't drink so much, uh, a little glass of white wine every once in a while. Um, but Lowell and Warren were a different story. Um, so, so this is them talking about being together. A letter from Warren to Peter Taylor narrates, quote, I'm looking forward with great pleasure to seeing you all. It's fine that Cal, that's Lowell, would be there and John and Randall. Old home week, barbecue on the ground, beer in the keg, chicken droppings on the grass where you sit. Jarrell's description of a visit from Lowell the same year further exemplifies what their time was like when they were together. Quote, I have been talking and listening steadily for five days. That year in particular, they would have had a lot to discuss. Following Jarrell's 1946 Guggenheim Fellowship, both Warren and Lowell each earned a Guggenheim and a Pulitzer Prize in 1947. Jarrell, who has never been as publicly acclaimed as his friends, was still enjoying success among literary circles from Little Friend, Little Friend, and publishing additional poems that would be collected in losses. In addition to their own poetic progress, evidence makes it safe to assume that they were also discussing Robert Frost. Pritchard, that's J one of Jarrell's biographers, can't quite explain Jarrell's newfound interest in Frost that year. He notes that in Jarrell's Kenyan days, he had been, quote, contemptuous of Frost but changed his mind after rereading him in 1947 and giving a lecture on him at Indiana University. In his own career, this is still Pritchard, Jarrell had long aspired to get more speech into his poems, but didn't think of Frost as a poet notable for such effects. It is likely that his conversations with Lowell, who was himself attempting to loosen up his form so as to accommodate the sound of someone talking, spurred the interest in Frost. It's understandable why Pritchard would posit that Jarrell's reevaluation had, had been inspired by Lowell. Lowell did, after all, take a bus trip with Theodore Recchi to Vermont that year to visit Frost at his farm. And both Lowell and Jarrell were aiming for more conversational quality in their poetry. However, what Pritchard fails to note is that Warren, his renewed interest in Frost surfaced before that of Jarrell and Lowell. In fact, Warren presented a Hopwood lecture earlier that year entitled The Themes of Robert Frost, which is noticeably similar, similar to Jarrell's later article, The Other Frost. 
And this, this overlap is significant for American literary history because the qualities of Frost that Warren, Durrell, and Lowell emphasize, illustrate, and celebrate in lectures and in writing are precisely the characteristics that mark their mid-century poetic shift. Though they were already headed in this direction, Frost served as a steadfast signpost marking the path. An investigation into the lectures, articles, and letters from 1947 reveals how Warren, Jarrell, and Lowell looked to Frost as a model for the following. First, how to infuse ostensibly simple verse with multifaceted layers of meaning. Second, how to utilize concrete details to create an authentic presentation of the world. Third, how to capture the language of real men, both in diction and rhythm. And fourth, how to raise actual human experience to the universal level. Warren begins the themes of Robert Frost with his methodology for explicating Frost poems. Quote, we must be able to look forward as well as back as we move through the poem, be able to sense the complex of relationships and implications before we can truly have that immediate grasp. This statement directly echoes Jarrell's earlier 1942 lecture on poetic structure, which calls for poems to be read for, quote, extremely complicated systems of thoughts, perceptions, and emotions. So you see they're constantly trading back and forth ideas that we see echoed in um, you know, formal lectures and, and writing. This noticeable similarity points to the fact that both poets approached Frost from a similar mindset, one that prompted a dynamic approach to explicating poetry. Warren and Jarrell were equally impressed by the layers of complexity that underlie the deceptive simplicity of Frost poetry and by the pointed inclusion of specific details that add to the desired overall effect. Warren observes that stopping by woods on a snowy evening, that's one of Frost's poems, may be said to, quote, be simple, but this does not mean that the implications of the event are not complex. Just as Jarrell later acknowledges, quote, it is easy to underestimate the effect of Frost's poetry, in which, quote, objects have the tremendous strength of things merely put down and left to speak for themselves. Furthermore, in the Jarrell Holdings of the Berg Collection, uh, that's in New York City, great collection, by the way, lots of fun sorting through those archives. Um, so in those archives, there are five pages front and back of handwritten notes by Jarrell uh, on what he intended to ask Robert Frost when he was interviewing him for the Library of Congress. And on page four, by a scrawled title, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, Jarrell penned, quote, what kind of man do you think would write, some people want you not to understand, reader, but I want you to understand me wrong? Clearly, Jarrell was aware of the potential trappings of reading Frost's work merely on the surface level. So he wanted to ask Frost more about this, this idea of, you know, kind of purposely, um, not misleading, but just having this extra layer that is not easily seen on the surface level. Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening is exemplary for displaying how complexity underlies his poetry. The simple nouns and corresponding modifiers, such as the frozen lake, harness bells, and deep woods work together to create contrast, thereby attaining meaning from the situation of the narrative and creating palpable tension within the poem. Readers sense that there is a sinister pull for the narrator, the tempting promise of solitude and silence in death. The beast cannot understand the human impulse to consider anything other than survival, his harness bell serving to alert the narrator, both literally and figuratively, of the danger of premature sleep. Jarrell Lowell and Warren aim to imitate Frost's deceptive simplicity and skillful use of concrete details, as can be seen in Jarrell's poem, uh, The Night Before the Night Before Christmas and Seven League Crutches. These are Jarrell's lines. The girl trails towards the house and stares at her bitten nails, her bare red knees, and presses her chapped cold hands together. In Lowell's father's bedroom, this is from Life Studies, we get blue dots on the curtains, a blue kimono. And in Warren's The Hazel Leaf and Promises, which has resonances of frost stopping by woods in style, content, and metaph metaphysical underpinning, we get these lines. Tonight the woods are darkened. You have forgotten what pain had once drawn you forth. To remember it might yet be some pain, but to forget may too be pain. In Warren's poem, there's the same lone traveler in the deep woods, 
drawn deeper by the same unknown force, illustrated with the same simple language that speaks volumes. Warren's poem and Jarrell's night and Lowell's bedroom all contain the quality that Warren admires in Frost. They, quote, drop a stone into the pool of our being and the ripples spread. And by the way, I'd say that's what I was feeling um, when I was uh, a freshman and a graduate student about, about their poetry, those ripples just spreading with meaning. Warren claims that this powerful impact in Frost's work stems partly from the, quote, simple contrast that t transform into deeper layers of meaning. Jarrell dutifully echoes Warren in his essay, claiming, quote, the contrast Frost gets from his grayed or unsaturated shades are often more satisfying to a thoughtful rhetorician than some dazzling arrangement of prismatic colors. So focusing on the nuances. The same may be said of those purposeful contrasts in the later poetry of Warren, Jarrell, and Lowell. Another large part of what they collectively admired in Frost is how he presents these complex, complex contrasts, effective points of tension, and surprising depth in his poetry, all while writing the speech of ordinary men. Jarrell overflows with praise for how Frost, quote, uses sometimes with absolute mastery the rhythms of actual speech to achieve great ends. Lowell echoes this sentiment in an interview with Fred Frederick Seidel as he admires Frost's, quote, sense of rhythm and words and composition, and how he gets into his lines language that is very much like the language he speaks. It is evident from poems as early as the Ballad of Billy Potts that Warren also aimed to bring his poems to life with vernacular speech, both in dialogue and breath-like rhythms. Essentially, the authors traded the lofty prophetic tone of Eliot and Tate for the living, breathing spe speech of Frost, as in Frost's Out Out, a tragic narrative of a boy who chops off his hand while cutting wood and dies. Um, and I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit here. Um, I explicate Frost's poem Out Out, but the gist of it is, uh, like stopping by woods on a snowy evening, the deceptively simple language and ordinary speech-like rhythms of men give way to larger philosophical depths. In this case, the human impulse to be exculpated from guilt, as Fro Frost ends his poem, quote, and they, since they were not the one dead, turned to their affairs. This is a glimpse of uh, one ugly but very true side of humanity. I got a little more for you. An additional element that all three poets admired in Frost is how he creates universal portrayals of rural life that are rooted in real human experience. Lowell praises the work of Elizabeth Bishop in 1947, so same year, Frost is on his mind, by comparing her to Frost. Bishop's work's purpose is to heighten and dramatize the descri dis, uh, description and at the same time to unify and universalize it. In this and in her marvelous command of shifting speech tones, Bishop resembles Robert Frost, which of course is a great compliment. Invoking a similar sentiment in an analysis of after apple picking, Warren identifies Frost's aesthetic theory in one of the implications of the poem's meaning. Quote, art must stem from the literal world, from the common body of experience, and must be a magnified dream of that experience as it has achieved meaning. In other words, the key to effectively presenting human experience in poetry is to heighten the raw material through the perception and artistic lens of the creator. This important distinction sets the later poetry of Warren, Jarrell, and Lowell apart from the overly simplistic, truly confessional poems of poor poets. Warren explains how a poem can provide, quote, a poignant chapter of biography, but we may remember that the poem is not an attempt merely to present the personal problem, but an attempt to transcend the personal problem, to objectify and universalize that we can distinguish the themes inherent in the poem as such from the personal theme or themes which remain irrevocably tied to the man. So through their post-World War II poetry, though it increasingly contains personal autobiographical elements, Warren, Jarrell, and Lowe succeed in raising such material um, to what they regarded as a universal level just as Frost attempts in his pastoral scenes. For example, Lowell draws from his childhood memories of the old South Boston Aquarium, which is right down the block from where he grew up, um, to create a narrator who recalls, these are Lowell's lines, once my nose crawled like a snail on the glass, my hand tingled to burst the bubbles, drifting from the noses of the cowed compliant fish. 
Jarrell re recollects his time in California. My lifetime got rid of, I sit in a dark blue sedan beside my great grandmother in Hollywood. And Warren portrays a sweet family moment. You leap like a fish flash in a bright air and reach out. Yes, I'm well aware, but this is the spot and hour for you to demand your flower. In these poems, they're each employing concrete sensory details to create a transcendent exploration of selfhood, not only for the narrator, but also for those who share in his humanity. Within these poets' mid-century quest for authenticity, there is also a noticeable shift from lyrical poems to narrative poems, replete with the realistic characters and dramatic scenes that were characteristic of Frost. Jarrell celebrates Frost's characters as, quote, living beings he has known or created with their real speech and real thoughts and real emotions, and further compliments Frost's, quote, wonderful dramatic monologues that come out of a knowledge of people that few poets had. Of these memorable characters, one may recall the female narrator of Frost's A Servant to Servants, who proclaims, these are Frost's lines, it's rest I want, there I have set it out, from cooking meals for hungry, hired men, and washing dishes after them, from doing things over and over that just won't stay done. I'm sure this resonates with all of us uh, in COVID times. Um, so in these lines, readers can detect an authenticity that resembles the voices of Kate Chopin's The Awakening and Charlotte, Perkin, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. Readers might also recall the contemplative, relatable neighbor who narrates Frost Mending Wall. Before I build a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. Again, within these lines, one may hear the real speech and real thoughts and real emotions that Jarrell touted in Frost's work. In addition to writing and speaking about Frost's admirable, admirable characteristics on their own, there's also tangible evidence that these writers were speaking to one another about Frost. For example, in the interview of Lowell, conducted by Warren and Clanth Brooks, Warren says to Lowell, quote, I remember now our talk of Frost some time back. He said, what makes a line stick in your head? A good line's got to be catchy. A good poem's got to be catchy. Now you want to say catchy is based on a dramatic element in the poem. Lowell thinks and responds to Warren with an anecdote about meeting Frost. Quote, Frost was the, the first poet I ever met who told me about this. Lowell describes how Frost read some Keats and pointed to a line stating, quote, there it comes alive. From this discussion, both Warren and Lowell agree that, quote, what we ultimately mean by dramatic in poetry is when the lines come alive. Looking at Jarrell's losses, 1948, Lowell's The Mills of the Cavanaugh's, 1951, and Warren's Brother to Dragons, 1953, one could argue that all three poets have the, quote, extremely wonderful dramatic and narrative element of Frost in mind, though all three books show room for further growth in their subsequent poems. And we do get that growth um, in, in their later, uh, later poems. So that's um, a little bit from the book here. And we have got just uh, a minute or two. Um, of course, we're not capped at 30 minutes. If there are any questions here, uh, and let's see, I'm seeing Gordon Vaness the third. I'm seeing a couple of questions here. Oh, Kyle Taylor, poetry, alcohol, and more. Yes. Um, what did these three poets think of Frost's introduction to new poets of England and America, which was so general as to suggest that Frost had not read these poets at all? Good question. Um, maybe you can inform me of the answer. I honestly, uh, in my research, I didn't come across that particular um, area, but maybe you can tell me about it. Um, if Jarrell and Warren learned nuances of image and narrative from Frost, was there anything you feel Frost learned from the poetry of the other two poets? That's also a great question, and that was uh, something that I chased for a little while. I wanted to see, you know, I was finding all of these great little nuggets and evidence of um, Warren, Jarrell, and Lowell's influence on each other. Couldn't quite find um, the, the other way around, and, you know, maybe part of that is just Frost's personality. Um, he didn't leave 
uh, you know, quite as many clues or hints uh, of, of these kinds of things. So didn't find evidence for that. Uh, if you have a sense of it, would love to see it. Um, a lyrical shift, yes, but weren't they also reacting against modernists such as Eliot and Pound? So I would refine that, reacting against. Um, Warren loved Eliot. Warren, when he was in college, uh, his roommates came back and Warren had painted scenes from the wasteland all over his college dorm. So he was enamored by Eliot and the rest of the poets were as well. I actually spend a lot of chapter one looking at the resonances of, um, of Eliot, of Kate, of Ransom uh, in their early poetry especially. So reacting against and, and pound as well. I don't know, it, they, they, yes, they wanted, they, they very much had the sense of we need to do something different. We need to make this poetry more accessible. It's post-World War II. We have seen truly hor horrific atrocities. Uh, we kind of want a colloquy with our audience. So they, so they wanted to have this dialogue, but they did not leave those traces of modernism behind. You still feel it in some of the way, the juxtapositions um, that, are, that are very much reminiscent of Eliot, for example. Uh, their, their integration of the objective correlative. That's even in uh, Lowell's you know, latest work. So reacting against, maybe um, this is you know, Harold Bloom's The Anxiety of Influence, uh, feeling the pressure, wanting to do something different but also respecting that what those poets had harnessed was truly powerful. Great question. Um, all right, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see, it feels as if your receptivity to the emotion of the poetry and the intellectual friendship of the poets helps you develop an argument and analysis that takes you beyond dry literary debates. How do you think we readers should approach a poem to get out of it what you get out of it. And that is from one of my amazing professors at Loyola, a uh, political science professor, Professor Holt. Thank you. <sighs> how, how do you as readers get out of it the same elements? I would argue that a lot of the power, um, I mean, yes, I'm coming to it with more of a personal knowledge of them, but their allusions um, to history, to historical events, give you great clues as to how these ripple effects should be hitting you. So when Warren talks about history or a war, um, he doesn't just talk about you know the current war. He also invokes uh, references to ancient Greece. And, uh, and same can be said of Lowell, of Jarrell, uh, constantly with an awareness of history. And all three of them, and I talk about this in the later chapters, all three of them are huge proponents of um, you know, being aware of your history, personal history, regional history, national history. And, and that is part of being a, a human being is having this greater awareness of what has come before. And so I think coming to their poetry with that same eye, there's an illusion, look it up if you don't know it. I mean, this is more for you know what I talk to my students about and knowing that history of the illusion will give you a greater sense of uh, the tone of the poem or, or the sentiment of, of how they're appreciating and approaching this different material. Also sound, oh my gosh, they have such an awareness of you know, when to speed up uh, the, the pace and when to use end stops and when to use you know, a bunch of L's to give sort of a lulling, lovely illusion and then boom, stark contrast with these hard consonants. So um, just paying attention to language and sounds in your mouth when you read it out loud, uh, you could get a great sense of the, the emotion of, of the work. Um, Joseph, good buddy, Joseph Boyne, would you say their interest in Frost was a continuation of the influence that Ransom had on all three? Ha, huh, good question. Um, probably, I mean, as we know, Ransom, formalism, uh, you know, very much attention to form and uh, content illuminating form that they were in inextricably linked. And Frost uh, being someone who was also very aware of form, you think of something like a sonnet of design, 
how perfect that sonnet is. I always use that uh, to teach sonnets because it's just so perfectly crafted uh, with, with each move in that sonnet. So certainly Ransom um, might have uh, led them, you know, in this direction. But as Pritchard said about Jarrell, you know, Jarrell was not really a fan of Frost earlier on. I don't think he, he felt the resonances. I think I want to give credit to Warren, as I do in a lot of my book. Uh, Warren deserves a lot more credit um, for what was happening in, in, in poetry at mid-century and beyond. So I think that Warren Topwood lecture um, is, is uh, to thank for that. Um, and I guess we can keep going here. I, I won't be offended if you guys leave, but I'll, <laughs> I'll answer a couple more questions. Uh, did you find any fun tennis stories from Lowell, Jarrell, and Warren? And do you think the free verses like play, playing tennis without a net, quote from Frost, was throwing shade? Love it, Brian Oliu. Uh, good buddy from Loyola. So um, I think maybe, Brian, you are brilliant and a great uh, great writer in your own right. So you're probably aware that Jarrell was an avid tennis player. I don't have any stories about Jarrell playing tennis with uh, Warren and Lowell, but I will say in the archives, there are amazing uh, shots, action shots of Jarrell. Just le he was so athletic and um, he loved cats and was like a cat in his athleticism. So there's just like a bunch of still shots of him leaping, taking off on the tennis court uh, and flying through the air. And those are worth, uh, worth looking at. I didn't end up including them in, I have a, a picture section in the middle uh, the tennis shots did not get in there, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure that um, that might be a nod. Uh, I don't know about throwing shade, but yeah, tennis tennis was, was Jarrell's, Jarrell's big game. Um, Frost was the publisher's reader for Ransom First Book. Thank you, John Burt. Um, John Burt, you need to get on Jeopardy. John Burt knows everything. <laughs> um, thank you for that great fact. Uh, Jarrell and Dickey were both actually in the Second World War. Do you sense any difference with these two poets when you compare them to Lowell, say, or even Frost? Uh, another great question uh, by Gordon Venice the third. So, Jarrell, oh, and I love Dickey. We can let's talk about Dickey uh, in a whole other place because I, I love Dickey's work. So with Jarrell, um, Jarrell, yes, did participate in the war and. Jarrell actually got pigeonholed because everybody knows, um, you know, his his sh very short poem about the turret gunner um, washed out with a hose, uh, that short, hard hitting few lines. Um, and so he did sort of get labeled as war poet. I don't think it was a bad thing because I do believe when you look at Jarrell's poetry before his experience with the war and afterwards, certainly gave him so much content and material to work with. And uh, so that's really when Jarrell started coming into his own as a poet, having that, um, you know, just that life experience and that deep sense of humanity that of course you get from participating in war, um, it ended up uh, bringing life to his poetry. Um, comparing that with Frost, I think that would take another whole, uh, another whole, conversation, but more of Frost focusing on those pastorals and Jarrell maybe bringing in more um, of larger concepts, more global concepts. Uh, Ransom played tennis too. Good to know, John Burt. Um, where does your research take us next? Uh, surely with your energy, this is just the beginning. Thank you, Kat, my dear friend. Um, I, I've got a lot of thoughts and I'm trying to land on the next on the, on the next big project, I like doing books, so I, I want to do another book. Um, I have some ideas. So in this book, uh, I do, I, I get into the later poetry of, you know, all three poets, but especially in Warren's work, I am just blown away by his later poetry. Everything, you know, Brother to Dragons, 1953, Promises, 1957 everything after that is just stunning work and certainly there are plenty of book length works on his later work but i think that there's still more to be said uh, especially when you look at warren and uh and where his legacy 
is, is taking him. You look at poets like Natasha Tretheway, you know, our former poet laureate, um, or David Bottoms, um, and, and on and on, just some, some wonderful current poets who are in the legacy of Warren. I would love to trace that out. Um, I think there's more work to be done. Um, also, my, my other project, so before I uh, decided on Warren, Lowell, and Jarrell for, for my, uh, my dissertation, I was actually researching heavily Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein and William James's pragmatism. Um, and so I have just this germ of, uh, of an idea and again, sort of an, an influence piece, looking at Gertrude Stein's uh, influence and, and William James's pragmatism on Hemingway. So um, maybe, maybe going to the, to the fiction realm there. Um, and I've got some other pet projects, but maybe, maybe that's enough. Um, John Burt, Warren had a great gift of finding what matters in poets people underestimate. He did that for Frost and for Melville when he was forgotten as a poet, and for Whittier, whom he was first to take seriously. You're absolutely right. Uh, of course you're right, John Burt. Um, Warren w just had an incredible eye and certainly was, was able to see things that others were not, and I think that's why he had such a great impact on these poets. Um, now that you've published your book, Derek, great to see you, Derek. Uh, what advice would you give aspiring academic writers on the writing and research process to achieve this goal? Uh, Derek, I did it a weird way. I, I think that I did it um, differently than most. I, coming off the dissertation, um, this is a completely different work than my dissertation. Um, my dissertation was uh, a completely different structure. I had like just a chapter on Warren, a chapter on Lowell, a chapter on Jarrell and some introductory material and some other stuff. So I completely streamlined it, I, I cut a bunch, um, I wrote three new chapters, and I took a big gamble. I wrote the entire manuscript from start to finish before even reaching out to LSU. And again, LSU was always on my mind um, for this book, so I put all my eggs in that one basket. And so when I finally did reach out to LSU, I had the entire manuscript in hand. Of course, it's a risk because, you know, I'm not publishing along the way. Um, but for me, I wanted to feel confident. And once I finished this manuscript, I said, okay, I've got something. Let's, let's see if it's worth anything. Uh, and thankfully, the amazing LSU Press uh, and James Long, the acquisitions editor, who is incredible, um, picked it up. But Derek, let's talk because you have so much great work and I would love to see um, your book one day. Um, LSU Press, we have a revised edition of Brother to, Jag to Dragons by Robert Pym Warren available through LSU Press. Fantastic. Don't miss Brother to Dragons. If you liked Hamilton, uh, you will love Brother to Dragons. Warren did it first. Um, so, so yeah, if, if you like to play Hamilton, certainly take, take a look at Brother to Dragons. Um, all right, well, that's all of the questions, and I have certainly run over time from your incredible questions. LSU Press, if you are interested, I'm a, a terrible saleswoman, um, but I will say LSU Press, if you look in, in the link, uh, they're offering 40% off the book today. Um, so if you want, go ahead, take advantage of that 40% off. That's better than any price I could get. Um, so certainly take advantage of that. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, this was great to see your names and to feel your support. And uh, be well, take care, read poetry, and see you all soon. Thank you.